this is one of those lectures that's like, there's so many things I want to talk about. I probably could have broken this up into two lectures, uh, but just for, since we're short on time, you know, the semester's already, already packed as it is, we're going to do one, one lecture on this. So the, the high level idea with, with database compression, as we see, is that the, we want to be able to have the system do more with less, right? So using less memory, potentially also less CPU, we can execute larger and larger data sets or more complex queries. So that's the high level goal today. Before we jump into this, I just want to have one quick announcement. I'll also post this on Piazza uh, tonight. We have a uh, database tech talk coming this, this Thursday at, at noon over in CIC on, on the fourth floor. So this will be the CEO and co-founder of Splice Machine. Um, he actually is CMU alum. Uh, he graduated here in like 1985, before there was CS. I think it might be in engineering or something, whatever. Um, he's also actually on the board of the board of advisors for the School of Computer Science, like on the on the dean's council. So he's coming in town to meet with the dean's people to make sure that like the school is running okay. But he has time to spend and talk about uh, the system they're running. So Splice Machine is a HTAP database startup. It combines, uh, if I remember correctly, it combines HBase plus Spark. So you can do all your transactions on HBase, and they extend HBase to actually make it be transactional. Um, and then when you have analytical queries, they can sort of uh, route some of those queries operations that go on, on the Spark side of things. But to you, again, as we talked about before with HTAP, it's presented to the, the application as a single logical database instance, underneath the, but underneath the covers is actually has two different engines. So Monty's a good guy. Um, Splice Machine actually runs on top of HDFS, because that's HBase and Spark. So it's a distributed database system, not an in-memory system like we're talking about here in the semester. But they actually do some of the same techniques, because it's a database system, that we've been talking about so far and, they'll, and they'll, we'll talk about in the future. So in particular, they do query compilation, um, vectorization, and uh, you know, obviously they built their own query optimizer. So there's free pizza too, if that entices you even more. So I'll send an announcement, you should come to that. Uh, Monty, Monty's a good guy, and he'll, again, he'll go into technical details. This is not like some marketing bull all right. All right. So as I said, we have a lot to discuss. Let's jump right into it. So first, I'll start off doing a background on what database compression actually means. Then we'll talk about uh, naive database compression. And then we'll spend most of our time talking about the columnar compression, which is relevant to the paper you guys read. But we'll talk about other techniques other than dictionary encoding to do columnar uh, compression. And then hopefully, I always run out of time every year I try this. I'll try it one more time. Let's try to, we'll also talk about how to do compression on indexes, because this is actually research we've done here at Carnegie Mellon. All right, so compression. The, we didn't discuss compression if you took the intro class uh, last semester, but compression is used all the time in disk-based systems, because it's obvious, right? The, the disk is the slowest thing in the world that uh, we want to try to avoid having to go to it as much as possible. So in a disk-oriented database system, making the trade-off of I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll pay an extra CPU cost to do compression and decompression in exchange for improving or increasing the amount of uh, useful data I get for every disk I.O. that I have to do. So the disk is so slow that I, I'll use the, the, the most robust compression algorithm I can have to try to get as, pack as many data as not as much useful data as I can in the bits that I'm reading and writing out the disk so that when I go fetch it back in, I'm getting more tuples than I would have otherwise. So now in a in-memory database, the disk is gone. Memory is fast, but you know, not as fast as our CPU caches, but it's not a, you know, the huge gap of difference in performance as you know, from disk to memory. Um, and so in our world, it, it may not be a, or it's not as obvious that we want to pay a huge computational overhead in exchange for getting a better compression ratio, right? Because everything's already in memory. Of course, we obviously want to compress things because this allows us to use less memory to store a database. And memory's, you know, memory's expensive, both in terms of you know, buying it and putting it in your machine, but also maintaining it because you have to keep giving it energy to, to maintain the charge. So we want to use compression, but we have to be mindful of the trade-off of the speed of our query performance versus the compression ratio we get. And so to the best of my knowledge, every in-memory database that's, system that's out there that supports some type of comp compression is always going to uh, favor uh, performance over compression ratio. 
So that means that there'll be some compression algorithms that it, it, they won't use because the, the cost of compressing is, is not worth the, the, the benefit you actually get from it. So before we talk about uh, how we're going to compress our data, we should talk a little bit about why we can compress our data. Right? So this sort of sh should be obvious, but I think I just want to sort of state this at the beginning, and that way it'll sort of color our, 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 our thoughts and discussion going forward about what kind of compression schemes we're going to use. So in the worst case scenario, if every single value for every single attribute in every single tuple is completely random bits, then we're entirely f no compression scheme is going to be able to handle that at all. It's just random bits. But you know, think of like, you know, almost, uh, if you look at like the raw bits of like JPEGs, the raw bits of, of movies, those things, will be, from our perspective in a database, those would be considered random bits. And this is why you take an MP3 and try to run it through like gzip, you don't, you don't get that much, much benefit. But in actuality, the data that we're storing in our database, because we're a structured, we're, we're, we're about structured databases, the data itself is actually going to be highly skewed and amenable to compression. So this can be done in sort of, the way to think about this is, is, is across two dimensions. One is all the values within a single column or single attribute across all your tuples are going to be highly skewed. And again, the way to think about this is like, say you took every single uh, book that ever existed, uh, and then you just counted what words appear the most, right? It would end up looking like what is called a Ziptian distribution or a power law. So this is what the Brown corpus was. So in the 1960s, uh, some researchers at Brown University took what they thought was the most representative books of the English language and just counted the number of words that appeared in each of those books. And so the most common word, I think, is the word the, right? And then the next most common word turned out to appear in, in the text half as much as the previous one. So I think the next most common word was a, right? So if you have a million entries for the, you would have half a million entries for the next, next word a. And then the third word would be, appear as half as much as the previous one. Right? So this is what a Ziffian distribution is, or power law. Right? It, it, it's, uh, it's exponential. So if we know this, then we're going to know that the values we're trying to sort in our database would follow some, some similar pattern. This is very common. And so we can take advantage of this by using, a, uh, using less data to encode, in some ways, the most common, uh, most common byte sequences or words that appear in our, in our data set. The other kind of other dimension we have for our, uh, uh, our data is that they're going to have high correlation between attributes of the same tuple. All right, so what I mean by that is within one tuple, it may be the case that we don't need to store the entire raw value for every single column or every single attribute. We can actually piggyback, piggyback off each other and store some kind of more uh, compressed encoding scheme to say how this one value is correlated to another value, and therefore I don't need to store the whole raw value. So an example would be, say, you're ordering things on Amazon, right, and you have Amazon Prime, so Amazon is going to ship whatever you buy from them uh, in, in 24 hours. So I have to store my order date and my ship date for my purchase, so rather than storing a 64-bit timestamp for the order date and a 64-bit timestamp for the, the ship date, if I know the ship date is 24 hours from the, the order date, Maybe I'll have to store like a 16-bit offset, right? So we'll see a lot of examples, and you'll see a lot of examples in real-world data sets where you see these kind of patterns, and these are the kind of things we want to exploit in, in, our, in our compression schemes. So there's three high-level goals we're going to care about uh, in our database when we want to do compression. Right? And this is going to be different than what you see what I'll call naive compression schemes or, or general-purpose compression algorithms, like things like gzip or zip or... Uh, 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 LZ4, things like that, where you know, they're all about taking raw bytes from your files and then compressing them into a, a, single, you know, a, a single tarball or a single file. In our world, we want to encode or compress our data in such a way that's going to allow us to actually operate queries on top of them efficiently. So our first goal is that we would need to be able to produce fixed length values. Because all that same thing I talked about before when we talked about layout, Right, and word alignment and jumping to fixed length offsets, we still need to be able to do that. Right, so that means that if we have a piece of data that is, say, say 100 bytes, and we have a piece of data that is 101 bytes, we want to be able to compress them and have, have them be fi fixed length. 
Now for the varling stuff, we'll see this in a second when we talk about toast in, in Postgres. Since we can store these in these variable length pools anyway, we could use whatever compression scheme you want on them and produce variable length sizes. But for our fixed length data pool, for, those, for, that, for that data, that always needs to be fixed length of, uh, no matter what compression scheme we use. The next thing we want to be able to do is postpone decompression for as long as possible as we execute queries uh, up until the point where we have to expose the data to the outside world. All right, so the last class you guys read the paper about the row stores versus column stores, and they mentioned the term late materialization. It's the same idea. So I want to use, I want to execute my queries on compressed data as much as possible, and only when I have to produce the result for the query to the client, then I'll go ahead and decompress it. And right, this makes sense, right? Because otherwise, if I have to read a billion tuples and I have to and, and run a filter on that, and my filters only can produce one tuple as the output, I don't want to have to decompress one billion tuples just to then figure out here's the one I actually want. I want to be able to operate directly on the compressed data, and then the one that does match my filter, then I decompress that. All right, and the last one is that we we have to guarantee that whatever compression scheme we use is considered a a lossless compression scheme. So this should, should, should be obvious to everyone in the room, right? The difference between lossless and lossy, right? Every compression scheme we're going to have in our database has to be lossless because people get pissed if you go put some data in and then they try to go read it back out and you get something different, right? Uh, now with transactions and things updating, you know, we can ignore that. But in general, if, if I have my bank account has $100 today and I come back without taking any money out and I, I get back some other value, when I, when I read it back in, people notice that and people complain. So that means that any time we want to use a, what, a lossy compression scheme, where we're going to lose data in exchange for reducing the size of it in our compressed form, that always has to be done at the application level. Right? Because this requires a human to make a value judgment about whether the data you're giving up or throwing away is, is OK to lose. Right? So the example I always like to give is, like, say we have a a simple database application that's recording the temperature in this room, and it's recording it every one second. So every one second, it's going to take another 64-bit reading of, of the temperature. So one year from now, uh, I probably don't care about what was the exact temperature at 3.15 PM at, at five seconds, or six seconds, or seven seconds. So instead, maybe what I could do is just aggregate the, the, the the 60 seconds worth of data into one, one value. So I'm getting the average temperature for each minute. So this is, again, this is a lossy scheme because I can't reverse that average after I've, I've uh, combined everything or aggregated it. I can't get back what was the individual uh, temperature at, at every single second. Right? But again, I might not care about this in my application. But the database system is not going to know that you're OK with that. So we can't, we can't do this. So the <laughs> Another way to think about uh, lossy compression is, is if you end up actually not, or sort of another way to think about this compression schemes that we're talking about is, is another way is, is can we produce the result we want for our query without actually having to read all the data we normally would? So this is a technique called data skipping. So this is sort of orthogonal to compression. So what I'm going to talk about here will sort of be like the lossy versus lossless compression. Uh, but we can still do this if we, if we wanted to on top of the compression schemes we're talking about here today. It's just another way to think about what, what we're talking about. So with the idea of data skipping is that we want to produce the answer for our query, but without having to read all the data we, 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 we normally would. Right, so say we want to compute some aggregation, again, using my temperature example, I would have to scan, if, if I wanted to get the exact answer, I'd have to scan the entire table and you know, the, uh, the entire column, and then produce my aggregation. But instead, maybe what I could do is, in the first case, I could approximate what the answer actually really is by doing some kind of sampling on the, the base data, and then computing my query or executing my query just on that sample. So again, think about like if I'm tracking the, the visits to my website, do I really care about like the exact number of visitors that went to my website yesterday? Right? If, if, say, I have 900,000 visitors, say I sampled it and I came up with, with 899,000 visitors, that's probably good enough. Right? 
So these are, again, these are called proximate queries. It's more than just like you know, random sampling. There actually is some math behind this to actually keep track of what data you're sampling, what the confidence interval is. Right? So this is not just like I, I pick a run, bunch of random tuples and compute that. They actually do some, some extra work underneath the covers to provide some confidence about what the accuracy is for these, for these, uh, for these queries. So the idea is not new, but it's only in the, in the last couple of years that actually been, people have been building systems that actually can, can do this as a native first class uh, component to the query language. So BlinkDB was a project out of Berkeley um, from the AMP lab. This then got spun off as a startup called Snappy Data, which is, I think, Spark plus uh, Gemfire or Apache Geode. Um, XDB was an uh, approximate query extension for Postgres. And then in <coughs> Oracle in 2017, they added actually now approximate aggregation functions. So you can specify, like, I want to do an approximate count, and then here's the confidence interval or the confidence bound you have to provide for me. So another approach to reading less data or skipping data is called zone maps. And the way to think about this is that for every single block and every single column in each block, I'm going to pre-compute a bunch of aggregates. And then now as I execute my query, I go check to see whether the, uh, there could possibly be data in a block that would satisfy my filter that I'm doing. And I would know whether I need to even read that block or all, whether I need to read that block or not, and then I, I could skip it if not. So again, zone maps are, I think are really important. There, a lot of systems actually use them. I don't know where else to, to expose you to this. I think I taught this in the intro class. I'm sort of dumping on this to you guys now. It has nothing to do with compression. Again, it's orthogonal. You can do this plus compression. I just think it's important for you guys to see this because a bunch of systems will do this, and it's it's an obvious, it's a really good obvious idea that's not hard to implement. All right, so here's our original data. We have a single column, right, and it has five values. So in the zone map for this block, right, for this, for this, for this table, there'll be multiple blocks. For just for this block, we can then pre-compute the min, the max, the average, the sum of the count, whatever aggregations that we want. And so you could store this. Some systems will store this actually in the header of the block. Uh, other systems will actually store this separately. We actually had this implemented last year or two years ago. We would store this in, in the catalog itself. Uh, but in the disk-based system, they usually, I think they usually store it separately because you, know, you can pack a bunch of these in one page, and then from one disk seek, you get a bunch of different zone maps. All right, so now my query comes along, select star from table where value is greater than 600. So again, I know I have a zone map for this block, so I go check my predicate, value is greater than 600. So I check to see whether uh, there could ever possibly be a value greater than 600 in this block. In this case here, max the max value is 400 for this entire column. So I know that there could be no possible tuple that satisfies this predicate. So I just skip this block entirely. So this is what I was sort of saying. Like this example of data skipping that's lossy versus lossless. Lossless would be would be this because I'm not I'm always looking to see whether there possibly could be data. Uh, whereas the lossy scheme, like approximate query uh, processing, is you just you're you're guessing the 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 actual value. Okay, so let's talk about compression now. So if we, we know we want to have compression, right? It, it, it's sort of a, a no-brainer. Every major OLAP system that's been invented in the last 15 years is doing compression. It's sort of like the column store stuff. If you, if you build a system and say you want to do analytics and you're not a column store and you're not doing compression, like it's <laughs> like it's, 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 it's a non-starter for people. So the first question we got to figure out is what do we actually want to compress? Because this is going to end up to telling us or determining what compression schemes are actually going to be available to us. So for this, I'll call the this sort of first question the, the granularity of the compression. So the idea is, you know, what chunk of data in our in our database are we focusing on and doing compression on, right? <coughs> so the first approach is to do block level, and this is basically I have a, block, a bunch of block of bytes. And I just compress, compress what's inside of that. The next is to do tuple level compression. So this is where I take, say, a single row where all the bytes, all the attributes are contiguous in, in, in memory. And I'll just take that piece of data and compress that. Attribute level compression would be taking one single attribute within the tuple and compressing that. And then for this example, it would be the, the var len stuff that I talked about at the beginning. Like if you have a, uh, an object in your variable length pool, you can go ahead and compress the bytes that correspond to that single, that single attribute. So Postgres does this. Postgres is called toast. If you declare a, uh, 
a var binary or var char or text field that's really big and it exceeds some size, then they'll store this in a special toast variable length data pool and they just run gzip on that. Right, so it's, it's the one attribute, it ends up being compressed. And the last one, which is the one we're going to focus on the most, is the columnar compression. Where this is we're going, to ex we're going to compress multiple values across multiple tuples that are stored contiguously in a column. And you know, just focus on compressing that. Because this is going to, going to end up opening up way more opportunities to do more sophisticated things than the naive compression scheme you'd have to do in your block level compression or, or attribute level compression. Okay? All right, so let's focus on the most simplest type of compression you can do in a database, right? And this, if you're, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're not familiar with, with sort of the, the native database compression we're talking about uh, in the dictionary coding stuff in the paper you read or stuff, you know, the other, the other techniques we'll talk about, this is probably what most people think about when they think about database compression. So the basic idea is that we're just going to take a block of data, right, whether it's a single tuple or a chunk of, you know, a column chunk or a, a block itself, and we're just going to run that through your favorite general purpose uh, compression algorithm. And then whatever bytes come out, that's what we end up storing in the database. All right? So there's a bunch of different algorithms that people can use. Uh, you know, gzip and bzip, those guys are actually not good for databases because those are uh, computationally expensive to, to compress and decompress. Right? The, the conventional wisdom is that the the performance trade-off you have for having to run those algorithms is not worth the uh, is not worth the compression benefit you get from them. So instead, there's these bunch of other algorithms where they're not going to get as 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 good a compression, but these are going to be much faster. And actually, in general, for databases, we are actually okay with paying a larger penalty for faster. Uh, so we're, we'll pay a larger penalty to have slower uh, compression in exchange for faster decompression. Right? Think of this like when you, when you render a movie, like you know, compressing something with MP4, right? The, you're only going to really compress the data once, but you're going to potentially read it back multiple times. So you want to be able to read it back very, very quickly. Right? So some of these algorithms make that trade-off. Um, but in general, the conventional wisdom now is Z standard is the state of the art from Facebook. And this is what everyone, you know, if this is what if you're building a new system now today, this is what you would use. And you see a lot of examples of systems, like I, I saw this morning, it was a, a pull request for Git and Greenplum. You know, they've added Z standard support as well. So if you're building a new system, you want to use Z standard. Snappy is one from Google that people are sort of interested in as well. Um, again, they it's you don't get as good a compression ratio, but it's you get better performance. Uh, Bratly is actually an interesting one. This is also one from Facebook. And so this one, it's like for like HTML documents and the web, they actually have a predefined dictionary, a bunch of common, commonly used words. So you don't need to store a separate dictionary. That's sort of baked in the algorithm itself. Um, I don't know how well that would be for databases. I guess it depends on what you're actually storing. Oracle uh, actually has their own proprietary uh, compression algorithm called OZIP. Um, it's basically a... It's a dictionary encoding implementation that's designed for OLTP. I don't know the details of it. It's patented. I don't want to go read the patent, but um, what's, actually, what's also crazy about this, too, is they actually, since they bought Sun a few years ago now, and they control the Spark, you know, manufacturing the chip, uh, for some Spark newer CPUs, they actually put the OZIP algorithm in hardware. So you can do native compre decompression and compression of, of OZIP data directly on the CPU, which is um, all right, so let's see how we would actually would use a naive compression scheme. So again, we take bytes in, and it compresses it and spits bytes out. So for this, I want to show, I want to describe actually what InnoDB does in MySQL. So again, this is a disk-based system; it's not an in-memory system, but at a high level, the idea should be the same. So out on disk, we have our compressed pages, and the way it's going to work is. No matter, uh, or the, the, the end memory representation of the page is always going to be 16 kilobytes. But when we compress it, it has to be in either 1, 2, 4, 8, one of these powers of 2. Right? And we're going to do this because it's going to allow us to figure out how to store, uh, to, you know, to find easily free slots on in memory and on disk to basically do like a bin packing problem, like how to, how to put these pages in the smallest amount of data as possible. So that means like if I compress my, my in-memory page 
and it ends up being 2.1 kilobytes, I always have to round up and then store it as a, as a padded 4 kilobyte page. All right, so when I want to read data in, in, in MySQL on a compressed database, on a compressed page, uh, I'll always copy it and leave it compressed in my buffer pool. And then what they have in the, in the header of the disk page now is they have this thing called the mod log. So this allows them to record any changes to data on this page without having to decompress it. Think of this as like the version chain in, in, or the, the, delta, the delta chain in, in the BW tree. I can leave this thing, uh, leave this part immutable, and I append new delta, delta changes into this thing here. So anytime I need to read data though, I have to always uncompress it. Again, the, the, with naive compression scheme, the database system doesn't know anything about the data that's been compressed. Right? It's, the, the compression algorithm is a black box. Bytes in, bytes out. So if I need to read anything, I always have to uncompress it. And then the, the uncompressed size is always 16 kilobytes, but they also leave the compressed, the compressed version around. So what would happen is if I, have, if I have to read something, I uncompress it, read whatever I need to read, and then if I never go back and modify this thing, then if I need to free up a frame or slot in my, my buffer pool, I just keep, drop this thing and leave this thing around, right? So again, and then obviously at some point, the, 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 the delta chain gets too long and then you have to you know, uncompress it and, and combine it and, pack, and compact it again, right? But that's, we don't care about that for our, for our purpose here. So I've already spoiled what the, 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 the main issue with this is that Again, the data system doesn't know anything about the bytes in a naive compression scheme, right? So that means that if I want to access anything, I always have to decompress it. So this is to end up limiting the scope, which I'll explain what that is in a second, of our compression scheme, because if I try to, comp if my scope is compressed the entire table into one giant block, I'm super because anytime I need to go read any tuple, I have to decompress the entire thing. So that's why MySQL breaks it up in, in, um, into smaller chunks. The other aspect about this is that wh why this sucks, or why this is not going to be what we want to do for OLAP queries. I shouldn't say it sucks because you still want to do this in other cir circumstances. Is that there's, again, the algorithms don't know anything about what the data looks like, don't, doesn't know anything about how the queries are going to access on it. it. It's just sort of like a pickup truck. He bites in, bites out. So, if we're smart about what we're actually storing and what queries we want to run on it, then we can achieve that late materialization goal that we had in the beginning of delaying for as long as possible having to actually decompress the data. So this is, this is where we get into the columnar compression stuff that we want to talk about. Right? So the first thing we can observe is that for certain queries, like exact matches, natural joins, equality predicates, Things where we want to do, like, does something equal something? Well, if we know how the data is compressed, and we know what the query is because it's SQL, we know exactly what you're trying to do, then we can take advantage of that and maybe just compress the query itself and not have to decompress the data. All right, so say that we have a simple table, right, name and salary, and just two records, Andy and Lynn. So I'm not describing what compression scheme I'm using, but let's say I just replace uh, the values here for every single tuple with these symbols, right? So Andy becomes XX, Lynn becomes YY. So now for my query, select star from users where name equals Andy. So the database system knows how it compressed the data because it did it. You know, it's the thing that actually you know did it and records in the catalog that you know that this table or these columns or these blocks are compressed in this in this scheme. So now to do a lookup here, all I need to do is replace Andy with the symbol that I've compressed Andy over here with. So now when I want to do this, ignoring whether I have indexes or not, if I, now I'm doing sequential scan, I can do, do the comparison name equals XX and look at the compressed form of the data and never have to go back and decompress it. I can't do that in the naive scheme, uh, certainly not in the block level case. You could possibly do this on the attribute level case. right? I could run each of these strings here into to gzip, but that would be I wouldn't, you, know, you don't want to do that because you're not going to get a great you know, compression ratio. So again, if we know what the, how the data is, is compressed and we, see, we, then we know how to manipulate our queries to then operate directly on the compressed data. And only when I have to you know, find my match and send the result back out to the outside world, 
then I go back and decompress it. Now for range queries, we'll see this in a second, this is a bit more tricky to do. Um, you have to use an order preserving scheme. Yes? So this assumes that every uh, attribute is compressed to a fixed length. So his, his statement, his question is, this assumes that every attribute is compressed to a fixed length. Yes. Again, for the variable length stuff, since we're already storing pointers in the fixed length tuple to jump to the variable length pool, that we just let that thing, we, we, we could use snappy or gzip or whatever you want on those things and let that be variable length. For the fixed length data, because we want to be able to have, again, the word alignment and jump to offsets, everything needs to be fixed length. Okay, so we want to do columnar compression because we're focusing on OLAP, OLAP queries here, right? It's, OLAP queries are read-only. Uh, we're assuming the database is not going to be updated that often. We'll talk about how to handle that in a second. But we want to see how, what, kind of, what kind of compression we can get if we assume everything's going to be columns and we assume we're not going to have to make major updates to them. So I want to talk about seven different encoding schemes here. Uh, these are all used in, in various ways, in various forms, in a bunch of different systems. Uh, these are all considered state of the art. And then the spoiler would be dictionary encoding is the most important one, which is why I had you guys read that paper. And then we'll talk a little bit about the, the, uh, how to actually implement it at the end. But I want to cover these guys because this is, you know, these are real things that are actually out in the real world. All right, so the first one is called null suppression. Uh, the basic idea here is if we know our data is sparse, then rather than just storing a bunch of zeros, a bunch of nulls all over the place, we can instead just store a uh, little, little descriptor that says this thing, or this attribute is null in our column for this many steps or this many tuples. Right? So now if I'm scanning along, I would see, see this, and I would say, all right, well, I, I know that there's a bunch of, um, a bunch of nulls ahead of me, so let me go ahead and, and skip beyond that. Now, this is a little bit tricky if you want to have fixed length offsets, right? There's, there's a, bu a bunch of stuff you actually have to do to maybe jump around. Um, you basically have to encode the entire thing, and this is a variant of what's called run length encoding, which I'll show in a second. So we'll talk about how to do the byte align bitmap codes in a second, there's ways to actually compress this even, even farther down instead of just storing the exact, uh, you know, the exact counts for the entire, uh, the entire column. All right, so run length encoding is a, the, the general purpose version of null suppression. Right, the idea here is that when we, if we recognize within our column we have the same value repeated a number of times, instead of storing that repeated value over and over again, we just store a triplet that says, at this position, uh, th this value is repeated this, many, this number of times. So for this one, the entire column has to be encoded using these triplets. Right? That, and then that way, I just do some arithmetic to figure out how to jump into my correct offset to find the value that, that I'm looking for. Right? So we'll see this in the next slide, but the way to get the most bang for your buck for rung length encoding is that you actually want to pre-sort the columns so that you maximize the number of these repeated runs. So in case of Vertica, Vertica actually doesn't support any, at least, at least last year, a mid of change, they don't support any B plus tree indexes. All columns are pre-sorted. And then it allows them basically to do binary search, which is the same thing as what a B plus tree is doing. Um, but because all the columns are pre-sorted, they can get huge speed ups or huge benefits of doing run, run length encoding. All right, so let's look at an example here. So say we have a simple table where we're keeping track of, of, of the students and that we have a column that says what their sex is. And for simplicity, assume it's male, female, right? Not other things. All right, so we want to compress this guy here. So again, instead of storing the, say we, we can store this as a single character, eight bits or one byte. Instead of storing you know, one byte for each of these guys here, instead we'll store this, this compressed form triplets where the first, visit, the first value of the triplet is the actual original value, male or female. The, the next value says the offset of where I am in my column. And then the third value in the triplet says, here's the number of times that this value has been repeated. Right? So what's, for this particular example, this is not a, we're not getting actually really great compression ratio here because we have this middle portion here where we go male, female, male, female. So 
we're storing a triplet, so uh, one byte for the, what the sex is, and then maybe 16 bits or, or 32 bits for the offset, 32 bits for the length. So we're not getting that great compression ratio here. We're getting actually negative compression because we're storing more data in the compressed form than in the original form. So to alleviate this, this is what I was saying what the sorting helps, helps with. So if I pre-sort this by male and female, right, so on, the, on the sex column, and of course I have to mo modify how, you know, the ordering of this thing because it has to still match my offsets here. So now in my compressed form, all I need is two triplets. Male with then, you know, offset zero, length run of six. Female, offset of seven, length of two, right? So for this example, it's, it's a toy example where I only have nine tuples, but now I think I have a, a database of a, of, a, of a billion people, right? And everyone's categorized as male, female. So now I can keep track of the sex of a billion people with two, you know, uh, two, say, 24 byte triplets. That's insane, right? Yes? Yeah. Is there a table in the compressed data graph where uh, the number between six and nine should be eight instead of seven? Uh, sorry, I mean, oh yeah, this, this, this should be sorted. So like this? Yeah, you know, we're above nine, that seven should be an eight, is what you're saying. Oh. Uh, one, two, three, six, seven, yes. Minor thing, thank you, yes. Okay. Um, do, you do you understand the high level idea, though? I don't care about the typo. Do you, do you understand, you understand the, the, the concept? Yes. Does this mean you only can have one column that's running encoded? So he says, does this mean you can only have one column that's running encoding encoded? No. So again, think of like it's it, it's it, it's not f***ing, but it's, it's another optimization problem where I can one figure out what order I want to, to sort my columns on, right? So say I have three columns here: ID, sex, and then zip code. So if I sort on sex first, then in, in, I would have all the males in different zip codes here, and then I would sort them, again, based on their zip code. Or I guess sort by zip code first, and then for every zip code, I would have a, I would say whether it's male or female, right? So that's, again, it's another optimization problem to decide in what order you want to sort your columns. In, in Vertica, they call these projections. Yes? Now, if you want to look for a particular ID, it would take much longer. So his question is, now if I want to look for a particular ID, would this take much longer? Uh, so you're just looking on this field here? Um, on this, yeah. Just to, I, I just want to find, I, I want to find six. Yeah. yeah. So his question is, now if I'm sorting, well, that assumes, you, I guess before you were assuming that you could do binary search on the ID, right? For this one, assume that there's an index up above this, that's again, it's orthogonal to the compression scheme we're talking about, Th then I could jump to this entry here. Right. Yeah. But again, you care about that for OLTP. For OLAP, I don't care about, I don't care about ID6, I care about the, the segment, the entire, you know, the entire column. Okay. So, run length encoding is super cool, uh, and we're going to see this in, in a bunch of other slides coming forward, you know, in, in, this, in this lecture, because we can actually use uh, running length encoding in conjunction with other compression schemes. So we can sort of piggyback or get uh, a, a multiplier effect of compressing compressed data even further using run length encoding. All right, so the next type of encoding compression scheme we can have is called bitmap encoding. And the basic idea here is that for every single unique value in our column, we're going to store a bitmap that keeps track of whether the tuple of that particular offset has that value or not, right? So the way they went again, the the if my if I have nine tuples or and the position the ith position in the in the column for you know in, in for the table, I'll have an ith position in each bitmap, and then it'll be either zero or one to determine whether I have that value or not, right? So. For this one, you have to allocate the entire bitmap, and of course you don't want to do that if you have a billion tuples, you want to allocate a one billion bit bitmap, because that, you know, the memory allocator has to then allocate a big chunk of space. So typically what you do is you break it up into maybe on a per block basis. So you have these bitmap uh, encode, encodings for the data within, a, uh, the column within a single block. And that way the, the bitmap doesn't get too big. 
So bitmap encoding only works, is only useful if the cardinality is low. So we go back to my, this example here, right? It's either male or female. I don't care whether it's sorted or not to do this. So, in, so to encode this column here as on a, with bitmaps, I'll create two bitmaps, one for male, one for female. And again, there's a one that determines whether it's a male or, or, or in this, this bitmap or one, in, or one here if it determines it's a female. Right, in this case here, there's only two possible values, so I could just have this be either, either or. Right, if I was pre-declared ahead of time what the, what, what the possible values were, like if, if it was an enum. But again, if I, have, if I have different types of sexes, then I have to have a column for each one, right? So again, if I want to go find for, for IDs 4, I know how to jump to this offset in my, in my columns when it's uncompressed, and I know how to do the same thing to jump to my offsets within my bitmaps. So the original data, just for this column here, was nine one bytes, right, or nine eight bits. So this is 72 bits. In my compressed form, I can store the bitmaps as uh, two nine, you know, nine slot bitmaps, so that's 18, 18 bits. And then I need to keep track of the original values, male or female, I encode those both in, in one byte, so those are 16 bits. So the original size of the data was 72 bits, but in compressed form, I can get it down to 34 bits. That's not bad, right? All right, so again, this bitmap encoding works if your cardinality is low. Male, female, I have two possible values, so I only need two bitmaps. Let's look at an example where things go wrong, right? So say I have my customer table, and I want to build, do, do bitmap compression on the, the zip code column. So assume we have 10 million people in our, in our, in our database, in our table. There's, there's 43,000, uh, give or take, zip codes in the United States. So in the uncompressed form, assuming I'm storing this zip code as a 32-bit integer, I can store all 10 million tuples for the single column in 40 megabytes. If now, if I use bitmap encoding, I need to have a bitmap that's 10 million digits long, 10 million bits long, for 43,000 possible different zip codes. All right, so now the bitmap encoding is 53 gigabytes. Right, so that, that's stupid, that's a bad trade-off. <coughs> right, so this is a good, a good example where you can actually get negative compression if you're not careful what compression scheme you're using. So the other issue is that depending on how we organize our bitmaps, we may have to go extend all 43,000 bitmaps every single time we, 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 we add a new entry, right? If we're doing block level, then this, is, this isn't a big deal because we would know how many tuples we can store on a block and we can pre-allocate our bitmaps for each of those. So with bitmap encoding, we actually can compress the bitmaps themselves, right? So there's two ways to do this. So one, we can go back to using the naive compression schemes we talked about before, because again, our bitmaps are just, just bytes. So we just take those bytes, run it through Snappy, run it through uh, you know, LZ4, and whatever comes out, we'll just, that's what we store, right? Downside of this, of course, is that we now have to decompress it any single time we want to do a lookup, because the, the, compressed ver the compressed bytes are a black box. We don't know how to jump to any offset to find the data that we actually want. The other approach is to use an encoding scheme like byte align bitmap codes, where it's going to be a variant of run length encoding that's designed explicitly for sparse bitmaps. So again, using the zip code example from here, I have 43,000 zip codes. Some of them have nobody living in them, like Montana, right? So you're going to have these, these huge swaths of, the, of, of, of regions of these bitmaps where it's entirely all zeros. So we can use rank, rank encoding to actually compress that even further. So I want to show one example of this. Uh, it's from the 1990s. It's a bit old. Uh, it's from Oracle. Oracle doesn't use this anymore, but I think it's a good way to sort of show you the kind of techniques you can do to do bitmap compression. So these are called Oracle BBC. BBC. Uh, so the basic idea of what's going to happen is that we're going to divide our bitmap into chunks and we're going to classify the, the, the entries of these chunks. So each chunk is going to have what are called gap bytes, where you're going to have sequences of eight bits, where all the bits are set to zero. And then you'll have these things called tail bytes, where after some sequences of, of gap bytes, where everything's all zeros, you're going to have a sequence of eight bits or one byte 
where at least one bit in that byte is set to one, right? All right, so you're gonna, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna break these up into chunks, where again, you're gonna have these uh, sequences of gap bytes followed by some tail bytes, and then the gap bytes can then be compressed with run length encoding, and then for the tail bytes, it gets, it gets a little complicated. Uh, you can either store them in comp un uh, uncompressed or verbatim, store the exact bits for each byte, right? Or if you know that there's a, it's a special case where you have a, a byte that only has one bit in it, you just store where that bit is, is located. So let me give an example here. All right, so this is our bitmap, right? So again, think of this as like the bitmap for, for one value that we for you know, within our column that we're encoding with bitmap compression. So here we see that we have a bunch of zeros and then three locations where we have a bytes with ones. Right, so we have one, one for that byte up there, we have one, one, this has one, one, and this one down here has, has two ones. So we're gonna now break it up into chunks. And I said a chunk is gonna be a sequence of one or more gap bytes where all the bits are zero, followed by a tail byte where at least one bit is one. So in this case here, this first chunk is two. We have two uh, one byte chunks, or one byte, uh, uh, byte one bytes, segments where it's all zeros, and then we have a tail byte here where one bit is set to one. And the second chunk is down here. Again, we have 13 uh, bytes with all zeros, and then we have two tail bytes with, with ones. So to encode the first byte, we're always going to store a, a one byte header. And the one byte header is going to tell us what's in our, our, in our chunk. And so the one byte for the header is now going to be broken up into three different parts. So I'll represent that down here. So the first three bits of the header byte is going to tell you the number of gap bytes we have in our chunk. So in this case here, we have two gap bytes where they're all zeros. So we just encode in the first three bits the number two. Then the next, next bit, the fourth bit, is called the special flag. And if this is set to one, then we say that our tail byte that we're storing at the end of our chunk is special. And special means that there's one bit that's set to one within the entire uh, within the entire byte. So then if this is set to one, right, because again, we have one bit up in here, then the, the next remaining bits, the next four bits, we just store the position of that one bit in our tail byte. So this here, we're storing the number four. So this is saying that one, two, three, four, the bit you want is stored here. Let's look at this guy here, a bit more complicated. So this one here has 13 gap bytes followed by two tail bytes. So in our header, we can't actually record in the first three bits more than seven gap bytes. So we have, if they're all set to one, we say that this is a special case that we have more gap bytes than we can encode here, and therefore the last, uh, the first header after the first byte after the header is going to tell you the number of gap bytes. So this thing's all one, so I know to jump here, look at this thing, and this is going to give me a value to tell me how many gut bytes I have, which is 13 here. Then now I come back into my special bit header. It's set to zero because I have more than two uh, tail bytes, all right, and this one here has more than, more than one entries. So this is set to zero, so then the next piece, this is telling me now how many verbatim bytes I have, or how many tail bytes I have, which is two, zero, or one, two, and then now I store the actual uh, tail bytes in uncompressed form at the end. Super complicated, right? But just, I, the, the main idea I want to show you here is a, a way to actually compress the bitmaps themselves. So for this example, the original bitmap was 18 bytes. In the compressed form, it was five bytes. Right? So that's, that's not bad. So as I said, nobody actually does this anymore. This is actually Oracle's proprietary format. I'm sure there's a patent about it. Um, but they don't do it anymore because it's not good for modern CPUs. Because I'm jumping around all over. I have indirection. I have to check this thing, and that tells me where I need to look here. Or if it's not set, then I jump over here. Right? This is bad for modern CPUs because all this branching uh, is going to, uh, if, if we have branch misprediction in our CPU, then, you know, we're going to be, be paying a big penalty of flushing out our instruction pipeline and go fetching in the things we should have executed. So as I said, Oracle abandoned this uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and now they use another approach called word-align hybrid encoding, 
um, which is also patented. Um, but this is designed for actually running on modern hardware. So the one thing I'll say though about this is that it still suffers from the using the naive compression scheme for a bit mask because I can't do random access on this. I always have to scan forward to figure out, you know, to find the position that I want to see whether I, you know, the value I'm looking for is, is a one or a zero. So I can't just jump to some offset and say, all right, what, what's going on? I always have to start from the beginning of the encoded bitmap until I find the position that I want. All right, so any questions about bitmap encoding? It's, you can get super great performance. Uh, we'll see other techniques to use bitmaps and other ways to encode data later on the semester. <coughs> um, you have to be careful whether you, you use it or not. But then we also showed here with the, the, the Oracle, the byte line codes, run length encoding can be also used to compress data within actually a, a compression scheme itself. All right, the next technique is called delta encoding. And the idea here is that instead of storing exact values again for every single uh, position or every single offset uh, in our column, we can actually exploit the fact that the values are not going to be that different from each other. And instead of storing the exact value, maybe I just store what the difference of my value is with, with the previous one. So let's say again, this is our example where we're recording from a sensor all the, the temperature of this room, and apparently it's really hot, it's 99 degrees in Fahrenheit. So every single minute we're taking a new reading. So the first thing we see is that if the, the interval between every tickle tick is, is uniform, right? It's always one minute. So maybe instead of storing the exact date or exact time here every sing, you know, for every single entry, I can, I can just say, what's the difference between this and this? Same thing for the temperature, right? The temperature is not going to wildly swing you know, from 90 degrees to zero degrees. Right? It's 99.5, 99.4. Right? These are small deltas from each other. So I can maybe just store that instead of storing, the, again, the full, the full uncompressed value. Right, so what I'll do is I'll start with whatever the, 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 the first value I have in my column, right, so 12 o'clock, 99.5, and I'll treat these as the base value. And then I'll compute deltas for everything that comes after this based on, the, on, on this base value here. So in this case here, actually for this one, I'm doing encoding from the previous one. So I start with that base value 12, and then I add one minute to that, and then one minute, to, one minute after this. So the way to think about this is like, in order to figure out what this exact time is, I have to scan from the beginning and then add plus one until I get to here, and that tells you what my current value is, right? There's other ways that you can do this, say what's always the delta between this and here, and record that, but then you're not gonna be able to run length of coding to compress this even further. Again, same thing for the, for the temperature, I'm just doing the deltas of these. So I sort of already spoiled what we can do of, of, for this, Right? We recognize here we're storing plus one over and over again, right? four times in a row. So I can just then just do run length encoding on this to compress this even further. So now to store uh, five different timestamps, I just need to store the original timestamp and then just what, what the delta is and how many times that it, it reappears. Right? So again, you can store this, the, 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 the base value here at the, at the just uncompressed the first column could be in the header of the column, or you could have a separate lookup table. It's usually, usually done in the header of the column. All right, so now a variant of delta encoding is called incremental encoding. And the basic idea here is that you recognize that within strings you have common prefixes. We saw this when we did pre prefix compression for B plus trees. And then instead of storing every single string in its entirety, I just store what's the difference with my, my previous one. So in here I have rob, robbed, robbing, and robot. So the first thing I need to figure out, what's the common prefix of my predecessor? So I store rob uncompressed because I always need the original one. And then this one goes and looks and says, well, from what, are the, what is the prefix that I'm sharing with this guy up here? So it's rob, right? So I store that. Then I do the same thing. I always look for the one uh, above me and say, what, what's the common prefix? So now what I store is in my compressed data, I say, Here's the prefix length, and here's the suffix length. So in this one here, I don't have a, uh, a value before me, so the prefix length is zero, and here's the full value. For this one here, I say, what is the length of the prefix that I can reuse from my previous entry, and then what is the remaining suffix? So for this one here, I want three characters of the previous one, R-O-B, and then the remaining three characters are B-E-D. This one is four, because it's, it's, uh, it's robbing, so I want to use R-O-B-B, four characters shared from this one, and then this ing that's different from this one. Again, 
you wouldn't want to use, use this for OLTP because if I want to jump to this one here and say what's the original value, I got to scan from the beginning and reconstruct it. Right? The difference is I could just say what's the difference between uh, my value and the base value, then I can do those jumps like that, but I'm not going to get as, as good compression. All right. All right, so this next approach is called mostly encoding. This is not really a compression scheme. Uh, it's just a way to recognize you can store data in a, in a, in a smaller, smaller type. So as far as I know, only Amazon Redshift supports this. Um, so the idea is that if I have values where even though I'm going to declare it as a 64-bit integer or some larger data type, but most of my values in my column are actually be stored as a, could be stored in a smaller data type, I'll declare it as a mostly type, and I'll store all my data as that smaller data type, and then for any value that exceeds the upper bounds of that smaller data type, I just have a special marker and say, I can't store the whole value here. Here's some, go to some lookup table. Here's where, where you can find it. So let's say that the application comes along and they declare things as a 64-bit in integer. You see these people do all the time, do this all the time, where they don't know what the hell they're actually doing when they, they, they create their schema. So they just say everything is going to be the largest type it ever could be. So I'm going to say I have these 64-bit integers, and only one of them is actually needs the full 64 bits. All these other guys here could be stored in just eight bits. So I'll, I'll encode my column as mostly, mostly eight, meaning I'm storing eight bits for my values. And then for that one value here at this offset that couldn't fit in eight bits, I just have a marker and say, here's how to go find the original value, or go look in this table and find the original value. And then I'm just organizing this lookup table based on the offset. So as I'm scanning along, I see this little flag that says, oh, I don't have the original value here. I know I'm at offset three. I go on my lookup table, find offset three, and then I can get the original value. Right, so this obviously would suck if you declare something as mostly eight or mostly 16, one of these, these special encoding, but then 99% you know, of your tuples you know, have to go in a separate lookup table. Because now as I scan along, I keep looking up in this thing and it's, I'm, it's, I'm doing terrible, right? And I would also get negative compression. Again, as far as I know, this is, this is only Redshift does this, and this is not something they do automatically. Like you have to declare that you want this, this special mostly type. All right, so now we can jump into dictionary compression. So as I said before, this is probably the most common compression scheme. Uh, it, the basic idea is that we want to recognize that we have repeated patterns in our data, and instead of storing them in, in their raw form, we want to represent them with some smaller, uh, smaller code. And then we have this thing called the dictionary that's going to allow us to be able to look up and say, for this given code, what is, uh, what is the original value? Or for this original value, what, what code should I use? I want to be able to go both directions. We also want to be able to support range queries, as we'll see in a second, because this is going to allow us to do, to then do, execute as many queries as possible as we can on the compressed data without having to decompress everything. So the bunch of design decisions we have to deal with when we, when we want to do dictionary compression. So first of all, when are we actually going to generate or construct our dictionary? When do we actually want to compress our data? What is the scope of the dictionary? Meaning what, what amount of data we should be looking at in our columns to decide that's the dictionary we want, to, we want to build? And then what data structure we want to use for the dictionary? And then what encoding scheme to use for the dictionary? So I'm going to focus on the first three. Um, for this one, the paper talks about it a little bit. right? There's the... There's Huffman codes, but you, you want to use the Hu-Tucker coding because that's order-preserving. There's a whole separate class here at CMU. I think it's called, um, uh, Rashmi teaches it. What's it called? Sorry. Type theory or, no, no. Um, yeah, 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 there's encoding schemes. There's a whole course on it. Go take that. That'll, that'll tell you how to do this. We don't care. We'll use whatever we can find, right? All right, so the first question is, when do we construct our dictionary? So the easiest way to do this is that we just compute the dictionary anytime we get a new tuple, right? So again, this is different than the, what the granularity is. Like, are we doing compression on the block or doing compression on the entire column, right? This is when do we actually want to generate our dictionary. So we can do this every single time, say, a block gets a new tuple, we then just, you know, rebuild the dictionary and re-encode everything, right? So the issue is going to be is that this is where the the why the scope or why the granularity matters because if I build the dictionary on the entire table, anytime I get a new tuple, I got to rebuild the dictionary from the entire table. 
Alternatively, I could do it on, on a per block basis, and then some data, older blocks that I've already compressed, I leave those alone anytime a new tuple goes up, shows up, and I don't have to recompress everything. The alternative would be to do incremental encoding, where I can take new tuples and I incorporate them into my existing dictionary and not have to re-encode everything else that's already been encoded. Right? The tricky thing is going to be is that if I want to be order preserving, I got to make sure that my any new code I put in fits into the right location in my uh, in, in my in my ordered encoding list, and we'll see some some examples how to handle this. Right. So the next thing is then also what is the scope of the dictionary? So I said this before. I was like, what is the at what how much data are actually we're going to be looking at when we build our dictionary? So we could do this on the block. We can do that at the table, or we can do this across multiple tables. So the block approach, the scope, is the most common approach. right? I have my block of tuples. I can do you know, whether I'm doing it on a column or on a tuple basis, right? or the entire block itself. I'll only build the dictionary for just that block. And again, the advantage of this is that the anytime a new tuple shows up, if I put it into a block that is not compressed, I, I can leave my other compressed blocks alone. I don't have to re-encode them. Now the downside is that you're not going to get as good compression ratio because the amount of redundant data within one block would be much less than the amount of redundant data within the entire table itself. But this approach is, is the one that's most uh, the most common. So Oracle famously uses this one, right? Because they actually store the dictionary in the block itself because they're paranoid about losing data. Because so, like, if you store the dictionary in, in a separate block and that block gets trashed, then you're because all your other blocks now you can't decode because the dictionary got lost. Whereas if you, if you embed the dictionary in the block itself, if the dictionary gets 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 you know gets gets trashed, then you just lose that one block. It doesn't affect any other blocks. For MRE databases, uh, well actually, so Amadou's not here. We actually just implemented dictionary encoding last week. Amadou did this. It's awesome. Uh, we stored we stored the dictionary in the block itself. But we're in memory. We're not worried about writing out to disk. All right, table level compression, uh, the table level scope has been the, we have a dictionary for the entire table, like all the, all, for the entire column, we have it for that entire table. Uh, this one you get better compression ratio because it'd be more redundant data. We're only storing the values in the dictionary once, right? Say in this case here, I'd have to store the dictionary every, for every single block, and this one's here, I have one dictionary for the entire column. Um, but it's, it's expensive to update, especially if you want to be order preserving, and you insert entries that now screw up your your, uh, your ordering. The last approach is, I don't think anybody actually does this, um, but if you recognize that you have dependencies between different tables on certain columns, maybe you can reuse the dictionary across those different tables. So if I have a foreign key reference from one table to another, rather than having two separate dictionaries for these, those, those two columns, I can, they can share the same dictionary. Because I know the values are going to be in the same domain because they have a foreign key on each other. So we won't talk about this here, but this is super useful when you want to do joins because if I have two columns that are compressed in different schemes or different dictionaries, in order to join them, I have to decompress one, then re-encode it to recompress it, and then I can do my join on my other table. Whereas if you're sharing the dictionary, then you just everything's already compressed in the right, right scheme and you just can go directly at each other. All right, so uh, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip this. Basically, one thing you could do also as well, instead of having one value represent a, or have a dic separate dictionary code for every single value, you could take two values together and generate a single, uh, single code for them. And that gets even better compression ratio. Uh, again, I don't, I don't think anybody actually does this, though. All right, so let's talk about the encoding scheme, uh, the encoding scheme of the dictionary. So we, we need our dictionary to do both decompression and or compression and decompression. So encode and decode, right? Because when we want to do encoding, we want, we want to take original values and then generate dictionary codes. And then when we want to produce output for the query, we want to say, all right, here's the compressed code. What is the original value? So we need to be able to go in both directions. And so the dictionary is essentially just going to be a data structure that's going to allow us to do this. So you would think, all right, maybe there's a nice hash function that could, could, could go, go both ways and provide this for us. It's not going to work because there's no magic hash function that, that's going to be 
uh, generate smaller codes for larger values and be guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be order preserving. Right? The only way you could actually implement this is if you had a lookup table to map you know, strings to, to hash codes. But that, that's the same thing as a dictionary. So right now there's no magic function. I don't want to say there never will be, but unlikely to be a magic function that'll do this for us. All right, so let's see why we care about order preserving. So let's say that we have a simple table here. We have three, th uh, one column, four values. So I want to make sure that whatever codes we generate follow the same ordering, the lexicographical ordering, as the original strings that they're encoding. So in this case here, if I sort my this this column here on on the on alphabetically, Andrea, Andy, Lynn, Prashant, my dictionary codes also follow that same order. Right? And the reason why I want to be able to do this is because for some queries, like name, like and, like A and D followed by the wild card, I can then do a lookup in my dictionary itself, figure out what just what values here satisfy my, 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 my predicate, and then rewrite the lookup to now be ba directly, based directly on the compressed values. So instead of having to run this string match, which is expensive, on every single uh, attribute here, I can then just do it on the, on the values in my dictionary, because that's going to be a much smaller number, you know, it's a much smaller number of records I'm going to have to look at, right? And then I can convert my query to be exactly this, this range lookup. And I can do, I, can, I know how to execute this efficiently with SIMD. So that's why we care about order preserving. So think about other operations too. Now we can do sorting on our data. Look at the order by clause. We can do that directly on these codes and not worry about decompressing it to the original form. Because the sort order for these guys will match the sort order of these guys. So that's why we care a lot about order preserving. So look, look at some other examples here. So for this one here, say I have my, in my query, I only care about the, uh, the name field, where this one here, before I was doing a select star, now I'm doing just a select on this projection. For this one here, we still are going to have to do our lookup on, on, on this because we have to still be able to decompress it here, right? But for this one here, I, I can compute this entire query just on the dictionary. Right, so in this one here, I still have to look at all the original compressed data. For this one here, I can just go directly on the dictionary, find the tuples that match my, my predicate, and since I only care about the distinct name, I never have to go look at this data here. Right, so the dictionary is this cool thing where I can actually just run queries in the dictionary and never have to look at, at the original data. And underneath the covers, again, the database system is going to make sure it's going to guarantee that this thing is always in sync with this. So it's not like we're going to see some, some entry in our dictionary that doesn't appear in our, the actual the data itself. So how can we build a dictionary? Well, there's three approaches. One is, uh, the most simplest one is to just use an array, where we just have uh, one array for all the variable length uh, values in our, in our dictionary. And then we have another array that has pointers to those offsets. Right? Think of that as like the, the key map we had in, inside of our B plus G node. Right? So this is actually what we implement in our, that Amadou implemented in our, our new system as of last week, because this follows the spec from uh, Apache era, which is an in-memory data format that we're trying to follow. So this is expensive to update, because I have to, if I insert a new tuple into my, uh, in, you know, in, into my lexicon, the thing I'm storing in my dictionary, I have to maybe shift a bunch of stuff around to, to insert it in between where it should be to make sure I'm still order preserving. Now that changes the offsets of the pointers, and that changes my dictionary codes. So I have to go re-encode everything. But what we're doing in our system, if you would do this once when you compact, it's essentially freezing a block, making it immutable, so we don't have to worry about updating this. Hash tables would, would, would another approach you'd use. The problem is you're not going to do range and prefix queries because you're not going to be able to have easy access to the, the, the actual values you're storing in the dictionary. And so the last approach I'll talk about is from a paper that I normally had the class read, but I, not this year, um, where they use actually an upside, uh, an upside down and right side up B plus tree. So you have two B plus trees going in two different directions. But in the middle layer, they actually share the leave nodes. And this allows you to do encoding and recoding in both directions. So it looks something like this. So at the, 
inside my, in the middle, I have these uh, sort of shared lease. And if I want to do encoding, I start with the original value, right? So this would be actually the, the, the key itself, the strings. And I traverse now into my leaf nodes, and then I can find the, the entry I want for, my, for, the, for, the, for the value I want to store, and I do my lookup for my code, right? If I want to go in the other direction, if I have an encoded value, again, in, my, in this, this B plus tree here, I'm storing it based on the codes, and now I know how to traverse and land into the leaf node that's going to have the data that I want. And again, I just do binary search inside of this. And so for this example here, uh, I'm actually, uh, this is an example of actually doing incremental encoding. So you, you can do all the additional compression stuff that we talked about before inside these leaf nodes themselves. And in this one here, I'm actually storing the, 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 the codes that offset to 10. So this gives me a little extra room now if I have to insert some stuff to keep it still in sorted order, I can still insert it in between, between this and not worry about having to re-encode everything. Right, so this says I, between 10 and 20, I can insert 10 entries or nine entries without having to recode everything. If now I have more than nine entries in between these two values, then I have to go re-encode my entire data set, which is gonna suck. So I actually think this is actually a really good idea. I think the paper you guys read is better because it sort of lays out the, the basis of dictionary encoding uh, a bit more straightforward. I think there's also a patent for this one too, so you can't use this either. Um, whatever. But I think, I think this, this is a really good approach. All right, so any questions about dictionary encoding? I realize that was like, you know, sort of rushed at the end. The basic idea is pretty straightforward. The thing you gotta be mindful of is that it's, the order preserving matters a lot. Again, the who tucker approach is the, has, is the encoding scheme you wanna use for this. And that's outside the scope of this, of this class. And then you need some kind of data structure that allows you efficiently go both in directions. If you care about doing incremental entries or incremental additions to your dictionary encoded data, then I think the B plus tree approach is the way to go. If everything's static, then using arrays is, is the right way. And we, our system now uses arrays. Okay, five minutes, let's do this. Okay, so I just wanna show you that Compression can be used in other parts of the database as well. So for all to be databases, they're going to have a lot of indexes because you want every transaction to always be an index lookup. You never want to have to do sequential scans in your transaction because that's going to be really, really slow. right? So the problem is that in, if you have a lot of indexes, it end up that the indexes actually take up a large portion of the overall database itself. And none of the compression schemes that we talked about so far will actually solve that problem for you. So this is actually a study we did a few years ago where we took some common uh, OTP benchmarks. TPCC, you guys know about. Articles, think it's like, uh, almost like looking like a Reddit or Hacker News kind of website. And then Voter is a benchmark from VoltDB, which is the Japanese version of American Idol where people call on the phone and vote, right? So it looks a lot like that. So the main thing I wanna point out here is that for these three different workloads, the total amount of memory being used for indexes can be up to almost 60% of the total amount of data we're storing in the database. So even if we do all that columnar compression stuff we talked about before, there's still a huge chunk of data in the indexes we have to store that we're not, you know, we're not, we're not compressing, right? So we came up with a technique called hybrid indexes, and we published this in Sigmod a few years ago. Uh, this was with uh, Dave Anderson and Juan Chen Zhang, who's a PhD student uh, working with Dave and myself. And the basic idea is that we're going to have two stage indexes. We're going to have one index where we store all the hot data, and that's going to be uncompressed form. And then we're going to have a compressed static index that's going to be much more, more <coughs> compact. And the idea is that every so often we're going to take all the data that's in the hot index and merge it into the cold static compressed index, right? The basic idea is pretty straightforward. So again, we have our dynamic index, that's your regular B plus tree, all your inserts, update, deletes go into this. And any single time I do a read, right, again, mentioning merge over there, anytime I do a read, I first check a bloom filter. Does everyone know what a bloom filter is? Raise your hand if you, if you know what a bloom filter is. All right, good, I'll cover this next class. All right, I, I, I assumed everyone did, but I realized you, you guys don't. Think of it like it's, it's an approximate set membership. So it's a really compact data structure that says, does this thing exist or not? It, it'll, it can give you uh, false positives. It can tell you something exists that doesn't actually exist, but it'll never give you false negatives. So if something's not in the Bloom filter, it definitely doesn't exist. So you go check this, and this will tell you, hey, the thing you actually want is in the dynamic index, right? And you go read there. 
Or it could say, hey, the thing you want isn't in here, and go check the static index. So again, this is the regular B plus tree, or skip list, or BW tree, whatever you want to use that we talked about before, and this is going to be some compressed data structure. That's going to look like a B plus tree, but it, it's going to be uh, much smaller. So where can, we, where can we save some bits in a B plus tree? Well, again, assuming this thing's static, we're not going to have to go and update it. So the B plus tree is really designed for doing efficient dynamic updates. Right? They have that rule that says the size of every node always has to be uh, half, at least half full. So they're storing a bunch of extra space, assuming that someone else can be able to come along and insert some data in here. So the first thing we recognize is that there's all these empty slots for, that we're never going to use because we already said that we're freezing this thing, we're making it immutable. So this is waste space. We can get rid of this. So now we end up with a, a much more compact uh, B plus tree. But then the next thing we can recognize is that we have all these pointers that allows us to you know, traverse from one node to the next, or maybe one, from, you know, from one level down to the next. Right? And these are going to be 64 bits, because these are just regular pointers to other nodes in the heap. So we can compress that even further and just store the leaf nodes as a giant array. And it almost looks like, like a skip list now. We have now some stuff at the top. These are just, just going to be offsets to allow us to jump into some place in that array. And since we know where everything is in memory, we can store these as less than 64 bits. So that's essentially what we're doing on the static side. We're removing all the extra space where we're pre-allocating storage for data that's never going to come, and we try to remove as many pointers as possible. And we can do this in the B plus tree, skip list, mass tree, and, we, and the art index as well. All, these, all those indexes can be compressed or compacted using th these techniques. Just to give you an idea of what performance benefit and storage benefit you can get from these, so in the, the dark line is the regional B plus tree, and then the red line is with the hybrid index. Again, we have the hybrid index is the dynamic one. We have a regular B plus tree in front of it, and we have a, a com compressed one in the second stage. And so what's crazy about this is that you actually, still, you actually get a performance benefit because the static side is now much smaller. It, you have fewer cache misses or fewer cache, cache line fills. And so you can store more data in, in your caches than you would otherwise as well as getting the benefit of having uh, the, the, you know, using less data, right? So these are correlated. Because you have less data, you're using less space to store your data, you're getting better performance. It's not always like I'm giving up, I'm giving up, you know, I'm, I'm getting better compression ratio in exchange for getting worse performance. When we get down to the cache line or cache level uh, granularity, storing less data makes a huge, huge difference. All right, 420 on the dot. Any questions about this? Again, just want to show you that there's, it's not just compressing columns, you can compress other things. Oracle lets you do all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, like Oracle, you can declare, I, here's my OLTP data, compress it this way, here's my sort of analytical data, compress it this way, and here's my archive data, I'm storing out into a really slow disk, do super heavy compression on that. All right, main takeaways. The dictionary encoding is the most useful compression scheme because it doesn't require us to pre-sort things, like we had to do an RLE or some of the delta encoding. We just take any data and we, we compress it. I think block level, block level order preserving dictionary compression is the right approach if you're building a new system today. You can get to specialized systems like time series databases where delta encoding and RLE makes a huge difference. Um, for general purpose databases, I think dictionary encoding is the way to go. And we saw techniques actually combine multiple compression schemes to get better, uh, to get better uh, compression ratios. And then we want to wait as long as possible to have to actually decompress data because that's going to be, that, you know, this, it requires us to copy less data from one stage to the next, or one operator to the next in our query plan. All right, next class is something I normally only cover at the end of the semester, but I'm actually going to move it up to be immediately after this because it's still related to all the store stuff we're talking about, is that it's the one class where we're actually going to deviate from our original charter in the beginning that said we're only going to worry about, worry about in-memory databases. For next class, we're going to bring back the disk. And we're going to say, what do we change for our in-memory database architecture if we now allow some data to be spilled out the disk? Right? In-memory databases are super fast, they're super awesome, but again, everything has to fit in memory. In a lot of environments, people want to be able to shove things out to cheaper storage. So we'll see how to do that. Okay? All right, any questions? Got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. 
Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you can still spill it. Cause ain't eyes and said, the pain I'm red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some same knives and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of snake pie.